Good morning. Uh, I'd like to continue today our discussion on Faraday's law and uh, particularly the transformer EMF. Uh, let me start from uh, a simple demo that shows what Faraday's law is all about. Uh, so here I have a magnet and I have two coils. One coil is bigger than the other. It has more turns than the other. And uh, you see that uh, the magnet generates magnetic field that is intercepted by the coil. Nothing happens here. There is no, can I have your attention, please? Can I have your attention, please? The, uh, excuse me, the class has started. Can I have your attention, please? All right. So uh, this demonstration shows the basic meaning of Ampere's law, what uh, the Ampere's law stands for. So you see here a magnet. There are two coils. One has more turns than the other. Uh, as long as the magnet is uh, stationary, nothing happens. So you see the uh, light bulb is off. The voltmeter that shows whether there is voltage shows that there is no voltage. Zero voltage, zero current. Now when I start moving the magnet, there is actually current. So the um, current that is, be, that is generated in the circuit uh, doesn't have to do anything with the flux itself. It has to do with the change of the flux. So you see right now the flux is present, but as long as it doesn't change, nothing happens. And uh, the second thing I want to say is that <coughs> You see that the uh, uh, bottom coil has more turns than the upper coil. Okay, so therefore, it will be intercepting more flux than the upper coil. So indeed, when I am moving the magnet here, you see that I see an effect in the light bulb. If I do the same in the upper coil, the effect will be smaller. So you see in the bottom coil, I have more in the upper coil less. So time rate of change of flux, but of course the amount of flux that is being intercepted uh, matters as well. So this is what Faraday's law is all about. And the mathematical statement now of Faraday's law is, is this one here, that this EMF is in fact minus the time rate of change of flux through a circuit. So this circuit can be a virtual circuit. It doesn't have to be a circuit made of wires. Right now, if I draw a virtual loop, since I'm intercepting time varying magnetic flux from all the transmitters that we have, both in this building and outside, radio, cellular communications, uh, access points uh, for the Utah on the network, I do have this electromotive force. If I have a circuit with cables, I can observe it, like in this voltmeter demonstration. But the electromotive force, theoretically, is always there. And this EMF is defined as the closed path integral of the electric field around the path where you want to find the EMF. Now, you can take this closed path integral clockwise, counterclockwise, whichever way you like. But once you have defined the DL, then the EMF that you will find acts as a virtual source that if it was positive, it would drive a current along the direction that you are tracing the loop. So you see that uh, the virtual source with which I am representing this effect, that now I have a closed circuit that has no other source, like in this demonstration, but now it has a current. I represent this with a virtual source, and this virtual source has to be placed in the circuit so that if it was positive, it would drive a current in the direction that we are tracing the loop. This is a very simple uh, rule to get always the polarity of the, v of the EMF right. Of course, this calculation will give you, as we saw in the example last time, a number. It will give you numbers that can be positive or negative, or can be a cosine that can be positive or negative. So simply that means that you take this convention, and if it is positive, the voltage points in the same polarity. If you get a negative number, the actual voltage is in the opposite polarity. And that's, that's all there is. But you do need this convention so that you understand whether the current flows this way or the other way. And the flux is defined as 
magnetic flux through the loop where now the ds that uh, defines the positive sense of flux of magnetic flux through the loop is defined through this right hand rule that I try to draw so if you use your right hand and uh, the rest of your fingers are tracing the loop your thumb points in the direction of positive flux so this is defined by right hand loop by right, right hand rule okay. so these are the basics and now you see that this d phi by dt that is the flux can change through the loop either because the loop changes or the loop is moving let's say for example an electric machine that is rotating inside the magnetic field or because the magnetic field changes so this d phi by dt the time varying flux can be caused either by time varying magnetic field or time varying s the area that intercepts the flux the area that intercepts the flux so I will focus today on examples uh, that correspond to the first model the time varying magnetic flux and that is what we call transformer EMF so uh, this uh, case where you have a fixed circuit but time varying flux is what we call transformer EMF the second case uh, the motional EMF I will uh, explain later and obviously you can have a combined uh, a combined effect of both motional and transformer EMF so before I uh, continue with today's lecture any questions on the previous lecture okay so then let me um, go to today's lecture so the first uh, example that uh, that I will present is actually the plane inductor so when we have an inductor and let's make an inductor out of a solenoid which we studied uh, quite a bit with uh, Amper's law uh, this is how the inductor looks like it has some voltage here VL there is a current and then that current flows around the inductor something like that and uh, generates magnetic flux so let's say we have uh, n turns here and we know that there will be a, a magnetic flux let me just make sure they have uh, the right uh, uh, polarity of the current so the current goes like this then there will be the magnetic flux that goes through like that okay so we have this magnetic flux as as a result this behaves as an inductor and uh, inductor fundamentally is a device that generates a magnetic flux that itself it intercepts so there will be a, as we uh, saw a flux linkage which basically is n times the flux through one turn of the solenoid and by definition 
that will be inductance times the current. In fact, we define, as you remember, the inductance as flux linkage divided by the current. So this is so far a definition. Now, and by the way, this is a very interesting concept. We don't get to realize how strange this looks like. Because what I have here essentially is a wire. The wire would be a short circuit, right? But then I take part of the wire and I just turn it around. And all of a sudden, now, it has voltage. And you have seen this as an inductor that has voltage L times di over dt. Uh, but we don't realize how strange this concept inherently is. Because I started from something that was just a plain short circuit that has zero voltage. And then all I do is I just turn it around like this. So I have the same short circuit. And somehow now there is voltage. And where does this voltage come from? This voltage is the EMF that we have from Faraday's law. And to see this, we simply have to apply uh, Faraday's law on the inductor. So this is the actual circuit. with this VL. And what I will do is I will define now a C where I will apply Faraday's law. So that uh, path is this one. It follows exactly the uh, circuit. It follows the inductor. So this is C, goes all around. This is DL. The DS, you see that uh, this circuit intercepts flux only through the turns of the solenoid. So the DSs are along the turns, like this. So it intercepts the flux that uh, uh, I call flux linkage in the inductor. So Faraday's law says that there will be an EMF along this path. And that EMF I can calculate as minus d phi by dt. This phi is the total flux. So it is what we call in the inductor the flux linkage. is n times the number of turns, that is, times the flux of one turn. So this is exactly the flux linkage. L times I uh, of the inductor. Let me call this IL since it goes through the inductor. And that's it. So this is the EMF. And now if you apply the Kirchhoff's voltage law around this loop, You see that minus VL, Kirchhoff's voltage law, when you encounter a voltage from the negative terminal to the positive, then you put it in with the minus. Minus VL minus the EMF is zero. That means that the voltage is the EMF, is minus the EMF. Minus minus d by dt L times current or L di by dt. In other words, the voltage current relation that you have seen in the inductor is Faraday's law applied on the inductor. It is a mystery. I don't think that uh, it is realized how mysterious it is that you take a, a, a plain wire that is a short circuit, you turn it around, and all of a sudden it appears to have a voltage, although it is just a short circuit uh, as plain as it can be. 
And it does because it intercepts now, before you see as a plain wire, it does intercept its own flux. Now that you have the turns, flux is being intercepted through those turns. As a result, you have this electromotive force, and it's just a matter of resolving uh, the relation between that electromotive force and the visa bell that you have in the circuit. So let me write it down here that the voltage current rel relation at an inductor is basically Faraday's law. The inductor. Okay. So this is it, the first example. Second example, since we're talking about transformer EMF, will be the transformers. So uh, what is a transformer? First of all, to make a transformer, we use what we call a magnetic core, that is a high magnetic permeability material. So we have three parts in a transformer. The core of the transformer. Usually it looks like this. And it, has, it is made out of a high permeability material. So we have here a mu sub C, the magnetic permeability of the core, to be very high. Uh, ideally, what we call the ideal transformer is, uh, uh, a, a, is made out of a core whose magnetic permeability goes to infinity. So it is a, a similar concept to the wire, let's say, that is made out of a conductor with conductivity sigma that we can take if the conductor is a perfect conductor that the conductivity goes to infinity. And if you remember from magnetic field boundary conditions, when you have such a high uh, permeability material, the magnetic flux is concentrated inside the material. The concept is similar to the wire uh, that is made out of a high conductivity material. So the current always flows on the wire. If you stretch the wire, if you bend the wire, the, the current will just follow along the wire, will not escape, let's say, the surrounding space simply because the surrounding space has very low conductivity to zero conductivity. So the current will always stay within the high conductivity material. Likewise, the magnetic flux along the core will stay approximately in a path like this within the core. So let me call this phi sub c. So the role of this magnetic permeability, high perma, uh, permeability material core is to concentrate the flux within the core. So overall, this looks pretty much like an electric circuit, but instead of driving current around, it actually drives magnetic flux. Uh, let me leave the basic definitions here, and I will continue on this side. <laughs> so the second part of the transformer is uh, what we call the primary coal, coil, sorry, um, so this is uh, the coil that is connected to a voltage source, 
So we take the core, and on the left, let's say, we connect a coil with n1 turns. So something like this. So this is the primary coil. Let's say that uh, this has voltage V1 and turns N1. And through the N1 turns goes this uh, flux of the core uh, that I uh, called F, uh, phi sub C. So we have here these flux lines uniform, almost uniform, that go through the N1 turns. So if I take this circuit and apply Faraday's law, so I will do it separately in a separate diagram, so that you see it. So here I have the core. Here I have the turns. This is the voltage V1. And I go and apply Faraday's law in a closed path, as always, that looks like this. So I'm following the direction of the current. So my closed path is defined like this. So it goes all around the inductor, just follows the current, and then closes on the other side. So therefore, as you see here, the right-hand rule tells me that the corresponding DS points upwards. That means that the flux, the way that I have defined it through the core, actually flows in the direction that, for Faraday's law, is the positive direction. Is the uh, direction of positive flux. So you see phi sub C here and DS point in the same direction. You can find this from the right hand rule. Again, the circuit intercepts flux from no other part of it than the um, turns of the inductor. So then Faraday's law tells me that there will be an EMF. That EMF, I can put it right here as uh, we said before, as a, a virtual source that if it was positive, it would drive current in the direction that I'm tracing the loop. So you see always a source drives a current from its positive terminal to the negative terminal. So indeed, since I'm tracing the loop like this, my virtual source has its positive terminal to the right. Okay. So this is uh, the most important thing to do. I don't think that... Um, uh, your textbook has this uh, kind of trick, but uh, I do think that uh, it uh, always gets the EMF right, so uh, that's why I will keep repeating its application again and again and again. Uh, and um, once, once one is familiar with it, then you see it works fairly well and gets you the polarity right. So now the EMF will be minus d phi by dt. And uh, phi is the flux that flows through the core times the number of turns. Because each turn, each turn of the coil intercepts phi sub c. So when you have n turns, in fact n1 we call them, you have total flux N1 times F sub C. So this is what we have here. It is minus N1 D phi C by DT. Phi sub C by DT. So obviously the number of turns does not change. So I don't have any time derivative to apply on the number of turns itself. Now if you go and apply here Kirchhoff's voltage law, you see that minus V1 
minus V EMF is zero. So therefore, actually V1 is N1 times D phi of the core by DT. So this is the relation between the flux that flows along the core and uh, the uh, voltage at this primary coil. Okay. Any questions up to this point? Yes, please. Can you, uh, can you explain the blue part that you have drawn in the Faraday's law? Is this like the assumed? So the blue part is the C in Faraday's law. Oh, like the, we are assuming this one, right? Uh, like the part. Well, I apply Faraday's law on this path. That's correct, yes. So when you apply Faraday's law, you are free to choose your path, and you are free to trace the path any way you like. Uh, so that is the first part, that's the blue curve. And now once I have the path, the EMF acts as a virtual source that if it was positive, it would drive the current in the direction that I'm tracing the loop. Okay, so once you have the EMF in, then you, have, uh, you can apply circuits loss from that point on. Right. Any other? Yeah, because you see the problem. If, if I didn't have the EMF, then I cannot explain why do I have a voltage there, right? It is a short circuit. If you go and, and apply, you, you see you come out of your circuit scores and you apply Kirchhoff's voltage law there, what do you get? V1 is zero, because you have a short circuit. Uh, you cannot explain either how the inductor works or how this works, because this is also an inductor, by the way. You see the primary coil is basically an inductor that you have wrapped around the, uh, the loop. So it's not surprising that we get exactly the same relation. Uh, so unless you have this EMF, you cannot explain why do you get there anything. You know? Yeah. For the phi C, right? Is it like just a flux of one term or flux of the So I assume that there is flux that's circulating and it's constant, just like in a current that I in a circuit that I have a constant current. The flux is generated in a transformer by these coils. So I'm about to draw a second coil and I will get to the flux uh, in, in a little bit. Uh, but uh, basically now that you have these inductors and you have the current, they will generate a flux, and that flux is trapped by the core inside. So when you have an inductor, you have uh, always a flux around it, right? That's the total flux that is produced by that. That's correct. There is flux C inside the, uh, the core. And that's constant. Constant, yes. I assume this to be constant, because it's just uh, circulating inside. It's trapped inside the core. Any other questions? Uh, I will, uh, once I have uh, the full transformer there, I will tell you exactly how much is this flux. So the third part is the secondary coil. And that secondary coil is wrapped on the other side of the transformer. So it is somewhere here. You see, I uh, present them one by one. Typically, this is uh, connected to a load. And this is uh, the voltage on the second coil. And uh, we define a current that comes out like this. Uh, now the um, flux still goes through like that. So this is uh, phi sub C. So now I apply uh, Faraday's law to find this uh, voltage that I have in the second coil. So you see, just solving the transformer, we need to apply Faraday's law twice. Uh, so the again, 
I will uh, go through the same process that I discussed with your classmate before. That is, the actual circuit is this one. It has uh, all these turns of the uh, secondary coil. Let's say these are N2 turns. This is where I uh, define my second voltage. Uh, and uh, let me apply Faraday's law now in uh, the opposite direction, uh, sorry, in, in this direction, still in the direction of the current, the I2. And uh, that means that I define a path that goes through the circuit like this. And then follows, 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 and then comes back here. And now, as you see, the DS, the corresponding DS, now that I am moving this way along the circuit, so let me just put the arrows. The corresponding DS is actually pointing upwards. So this is my DS. Okay. So that means now that for uh, the application of Faraday's law, and I chose this sense on purpose because I want to show you something here. This is probably the first example where we see this, that our DS is actually opposite to the way that the flux flows. So this F sub C flows downwards and DS points upwards. F sub C, phi sub C, sorry. Uh, is actually defined downwards. It's the same flux that went through the first coil and now has come around and goes through the second coil. So that means that when I apply Faraday's law, which will give me again this EMF, so you see since I am uh, moving this way, B dot ds. Now, my ds and my my ds points upwards, and the magnetic field points downwards. So, what comes out of here is not n2 times phi sub c, but minus n2 times sub c. Because you see now, for me, for Faraday's law, the positive sense of flux is upward, but the flux now points downwards, goes through downwards the way that I have defined it. So therefore, there has to be a minus sign there. And minus and minus cancel out, give me a plus, and I have that the EMF is N2 d phi sub c divided by dt. And then I go to the circuit and I apply KVL minus VEMF plus V2 is equal to zero. So now V2 is the EMF, the way that I have defined it, and it is N2 times d phi sub c by dt. So this is the second voltage. So one pertinent question is when, I, when we're talking about a transformer, what is being transformed? Well, this is what is being transformed because if you look at the first equation here for the first voltage and the second equation here for the second voltage, you see that on the transformer, and now the whole transformer, let me put it all together since uh, I analyzed each component separately. So we have the primary coil and the secondary coil. V1 here, V2 there. So from the first and the second equation, you see that V1 divided by V2 is equal to N1 over N2. 
So basically, uh, you have you can connect a source on the primary coil, and then you harvest a voltage on the secondary coil. Why do you harvest a voltage here? Well, that voltage is the EMF. It's what is being created by the time-varying flux. So we have uh, basically V2 equals to N2 over N1 V1. So I can choose this ratio of the turns in order to up-convert or down-convert the voltage. So that is what is being transformed. And that is not the only thing that is being transformed but, but in a transformer. Uh, but before I uh, move on, any questions up to this point? Yes, please. So this was uh, the uh, assumption that I had made. So what I called phi sub c was this circulating flux along the transformer in that sense. So I fixed that from the beginning when I introduced the core. Uh, I'll get back and calculate this. But uh, this was to begin with my phi sub c the way that I defined it. So because it comes around. So I didn't, I could have traced the loop in the other way, right? And in that case, there wouldn't be a minus sign. I didn't do it to confuse you, but my intention here is to show you that there may be a case where your DS will be pointing opposite to the flux. Then this is a dot product, remember. So dot product will be negative when the two vectors are opposite. So this is what we have here. We have one vector that the B points downwards as shown by the direction of the flux, whereas the DS, the way that I have chosen, and it's up to me to choose it, but so in this case I chose it to trace the loop, points upwards. Any other questions? You have a question? Yeah. yeah. So in the secondary coil, uh, I'm seeing you have already assigned the polarity of V2. Uh, yes. Like, do we assign it uh, in uh, circuit representations of transformers, this is the usual way that uh, these polarities are being uh, defined. So V1, V2, and then the currents always go to the right, both the left and the right. Um, so now let's go back to this flux and how it is defined. So we can uh, find this flux by applying Ampere's law on the transformer. So this is the transformer. And uh, by assuming that the flux will be concentrated, We have basically uh, magnetic flux lines that run around this core. So this magnetic flux line, where I have phi sub c, has a certain length. Let me assign that length of the magnetic flux line as L sub c. So let's say that the length of this is L sub c. And as you see here, I have this current that goes into the board with the N1 turns of the primary coil. And I have these current lines that come out of the board with these N2 turns of the secondary coil. So remember, whenever we have a clear view of the magnetic flux lines in a problem, we can apply Ampere's law along the flux line. So here that I have a flux line of length L sub c, that is I know that the magnetic field will be along this line, I can go and apply Ampere's law to find that magnetic field and ultimately to find the magnetic flux. So let me just go here. So 
So here is the idea. I apply Ampere's law along this magnetic flux line. I have these currents, the uh, current of the uh, primary coil. N1, I1, and the current of the secondary coil that comes out, N2, I2. When I apply Ampere's law, Ampere's law, remember, says that the line integral of the magnetic field is equal to the total enclosed current. Okay. And in fact, before I um, proceed, let me ask you to compare Ampere's law. So this is the Ampere law that we saw in magnetostatics and this law. E that the L is minus d phi by dt. You see that they are very similar. Their structure is identical, in fact, which makes me state the following, that just like currents generate magnetic uh, fields in Ampere's law, for example, we saw that a current like this generates circulating magnetic field, time varying flux generates electric field. So we'll come back to this uh, later when we talk about eddy currents, but keep this in mind, this structural uh, symmetry. Remember that when we have Ampere's law, just like here in Faraday's law that we have the positive sense of flux and a negative sense of flux, we also have a positive and negative sense of current flow. So now that I want to apply uh, Ampere's law like this, positive current flows into the board. Again, it's a right-hand rule. So here, I'm following a magnetic flux line. The magnetic field inside the core is constant. Remember that in a solenoid, the magnetic field is constant inside. So now you have that magnetic field, the constant magnetic field from the solenoid guided along the, the core. So the magnetic field remains constant. This integral is basically the magnetic field of the core times the length of the core. And now the enclosed current is how much? Anybody can uh, take a guess? Enclosed. The enclosed current. So I'm applying Ampere's law right here throughout the transformer. Well, you see so many wires there, some coming up, out, some coming in. But there is not, uh, the, it's not the same number of wires, nor the same current. So it is N1, I1, because the uh, primary currents go in the positive direction, minus N2, I2, because the other currents are going in the negative direction. So in fact, the magnetic field intensity in the core is N1, I1, So this is the magnetic field intensity. And I have two ways to find the magnetic flux density So the magnetic flux density will be mu of the core. And uh, you can also say that I know how much this will be because if uh, this flux through the core is phi sub c, so the transformer obviously will have this three-dimensional um, shape. And let's say if uh, the cross-section of the transformer is A, <coughs> A 
and I have flux phi sub c here. Okay. The magnetic flux density will be flux divided by cross section, just like the current density. In fact, it is very uh, intuitive to think about these concepts in terms of electric circuits. Just like in electric circuits, when you have a wire of cross section A, current I, the current density is current divided by the cross section. Here, similarly, this flux density is phi sub C divided by the area, by the cross section of the transformer. So now you, you have everything. The flux is generated by the currents. That gives rise to a magnetic field. And the magnetic field intensity is given by this. Now, here is the last part in this transformer. When the transformer is called an ideal transformer, just like the perfect conductor. So for the ideal transformer, this mu of the core tends to infinity. And then the magnetic field intensity, which is magnetic flux divided by mu of the core, or flux divided by mu times area. You see, when mu goes to infinity, the magnetic field goes to 0. So what does that mean? It means that. Uh, just like in a conductor, electric current, J, is equal conductivity times electric field. Okay? If the conductivity tends to infinity, if the conductivity of copper, for example, 5.7 times uh, 10 to the 8th Siemens, multiplies electric field and gives you an electric current of 0.1 amps, that means that the electric field is actually very, very small inside the perfect conductor. Same thing in what we call the ideal transformer. You can get out of a very small magnetic field intensity a very high magnetic flux because that small h will be multiplied by a very high mu. So the mu can be in the millions. The h can be a, a tiny amount of amps per meter. And yet the product can give you a magnetic flux that will make the transformer work. So because now h sub c goes to 0, if you look at this, the magnetic field is proportional to the difference between the currents. Then that means that n1 i1 minus n2 i2 goes to 0. And as a result, there is a second transformation. And that transformation is the transformation of the currents that uh, I1 over I2 is actually equal to N2 over N1. So we have the inverse transformation in the currents. So when the voltage goes from low to high, the current goes, goes from a high to low. And it has to be like that so that power is conserved because power is voltage times current. So when the voltage increases by a factor of x, the current has to decrease by the same factor in order to preserve the power because we have a generally lossless system. So whatever power we generate on the left has to end up on the load, at the load on the right. So we're not generating power here. We're not dissipating either because we, don't, we haven't assumed any losses. So everything will be uh, preserved. And finally, final transformation that we can see by looking at the circuit as a whole so I don't know how many uh, transformers I have drawn today. So this is a V1, I1, and the RL. OK. 
Okay. So this V1 by I1 is basically the input resistance that the voltage source sees by looking into the transformer. So this is V1 over I1 input resistance. The voltage current relation of the load is very simple. V2 over I2 is RL. Okay. However, we have these transformation relations. So V1, V1 is V2 times N1 over N2. Because V1 over V2 is N1 over N2. And then I1 is I2 times N2 over N1. Because the currents are transformed in the opposite way. And that means that V2 over I2, which is RL, times N1 over N2 squared gives you the input resistance. So we have three transformation relations. The voltage, V1 over V2, is N1 over N2. The current, I1 over N2, is N2 over N1. And then, as a result, the impedance transformation, R in, is RL, N1 over N2 squared. So I'll stop here. Thanks for your attention. I'll stick around for questions. And otherwise, we'll continue tomorrow. <laughs>